Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's nice to see so many familiar faces, but I will add that it's nice to see so many unfamiliar faces. I'm also a board member of the National Association for Olmstead Parks, and one of our purposes with a conference like this is really to broaden the discussion, so I'm glad to be speaking to a lot of people I don't know um, uh, on this very important subject. I'll be introducing a panel also, which I think will um, really um, sort of re-emphasize this idea that we want to broaden the discussion and talk about the future of national parks as well as their past. Um, the topic you see here today, defining the purpose of parks, is a rather ambitious topic, I think. I don't think we can do it alone. Fortunately, <laughs> we do have some help um, uh, in the form of these two individuals in their life and work, father and son. Um, and a lot of things will be said about Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. today, obviously. But one of the most important observations I think we can make, is, when, especially when defining the purpose of parks, which I hope to talk about a little bit uh, as an introduction to this panel, was the degree to which the younger Olmsted took his father's 19th century ideas and made them work for the social and technological and environmental realities of the 20th century. Think how radically new the 20th century was. Um, the, you know, immigration trends, the automobile, the widespread youth, use of telephones and electricity. We like to think about how new the 21st century is, but just think how, how, what a shock the 20th century was for people of that generation. And I think there are indeed park purposes and values and design principles that we can describe as Olmsteadian. Uh, and Olmsted Jr. made them work for a radically new century, the 20th century, uh, which of course begs the question, what about the 21st century? Who's going to make this work now? Uh, if we can look back and talk about this legacy, the Olmstedian legacy, and we can talk about it in, uh, in some detail, um, I think the real purpose of this panel and the panelists I'll be introducing will be, what about the 21st century? How are these ideas once again being revived? If Olmsted Jr. was able to do it for the 20th century, how are we going to do it for the 21st century? Uh, but first, I'd like to just go back and think about what these purposes and principles were and how they began, of course, with the father's great municipal park landscapes uh, like Central Park, often heavily constructed, heavily engineered. Uh, they needed to be changed to, in order to create the kinds of sequence of landscape experience that Olmsted Sr. felt needed to be created. Uh, but it's worth remembering that uh, while Central Park was being constructed, Olmsted is writing the 1865 Yosemite Report, and although it was never implemented exactly, it did lay out the intellectual framework for how and why a national system of large parks should be set aside and developed, as municipal park systems were, for the benefit and enjoyment of a broad and inclusive public. There's a basic uh, essential concept here that runs across scales and different contexts. And the practice of park making worked across these scales and contexts. And while the elder Olmsted was designing, for example, his most complete par municipal park system in Boston in the 1880s, he and Calvert Vox also created the plan for the state park at Niagara Falls, the first of its type uh, in the 1880s, uh, in which the principles and techniques of park making were used to restore and preserve um, uh, the landscape around the falls as a public park. How then to preserve great scenic landscapes like Yosemite Valley and Niagara Falls? Well, by making them into parks, designing circulation systems, for example, uh, that would maximize the power of public experience of these places while also preserving the delicate ecosystems around. Uh, because the circulation system would channel use and prevent these landscapes from being trampled to death, these very delicate eco. And of course, at Niagara Falls, Olmsted was particularly interested in the plant communities and, the, and all of the landscape around the falls as being vital to the experience of, of the main attraction, as it were. And so if we consider some of the design principles of public park making that the elder Olmsted is uh, putting into practice in the 19th century, uh, we can see that many of these ideas work across scales uh, for the management of vast public landscape reservations as well as uh, uh, smaller municipal parks. Uh, and there's an overall purpose that's consistent as well. Park development, park design, landscape architecture, in other words, roads, paths, other facilities can allow for and maximize meaningful public experiences of landscapes they really needed to create the maximum 
me uh, meaning of these experiences while keeping those landscapes intact, preserving them, in other words, because otherwise that all of that public enjoyment and, and meaning would have the effect of destroying these places. Uh, so we can look at two great iconic landscapes on the East Coast and the West Coast in very different contexts. Obviously, I'm aware of how different these places really are, uh, but they are both in the 1860s public park landscapes being designed uh, and, and, and sharing some fundamental purposes. Um, both are public parks. One is very designed, certainly, and changed. One is minimally changed, except, of course, for that vital idea of circulation, and systems, facilities uh, that will uh, allow the landscape to be preserved. And they both share a fundamental purpose, as described by Olmsted in his 1865 Yosemite report. Um, and I won't quote from it, but I will paraphrase. Basically, since the experience of landscape beauty or what we might simply today call nature, a somewhat uh, less adequate term, but nevertheless uh, probably analogous, that experience is necessary to human happiness and well-being, necessary to individuals to lead fulfilled life. Therefore, for governments, it's nothing short of a duty to act and to acquire and develop systems of public parks to make these places, these experiences, available to the many and not monopolized by the few. You know, if something is absolutely necessary for human happiness, it's necessary for a functioning society to make those experiences available to everyone, or at least as close to everyone as we can get. And we're getting closer all the time, I think. Uh, but, the, but the idea being that those experiences cannot be monopolized by the few, or government has literally failed. These are, these are, this makes parks vital to public health, in other words, in the broadest possible sense. Um, and it would be uh, at Yosemite, and in specifically in the conservation battle over the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park that would bring Olmsted Jr. into direct involvement as far as restating and revitalizing these ideals for the 20th century. The long battle that was lost, over, as you can see in the picture, uh, to dam the Hetch Hetchy uh, drew Olmsted Jr. into this controversy, and of course he oppo opposed the dam. Uh, and in his written opposition in 1913, he drew heavily on his father's 1865 Yosemite report. He quoted it at length. People think that report was lost or, or whatever, but it wasn't, certainly not to Olmsted Jr. He quotes from, at it, from it at length, and he prioritized the mandate of preservation as his father had, and although the battle was lost just a few years later in 1916, as Professor Deverell was just alluding to, the younger Olmsted drafted the portion of the NPS Organic Act, which created the agency and which defined the purposes for U.S. national parks. And this is a pretty famous quote, so I will put it up. The fundamental purpose of the parks was, as we know, to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. There are many park rangers who have this memorized, and they cannot tell you who wrote it, however. <laughs> uh, the connections in this text, back to his father's 1865 report, and, his, and the general theory and practice of park making are manifest. I mean, I have the, you know, we have the documents as well, but even if you didn't, you could see where this is coming from. Um, and it was at Yosemite, through his role with the Yosemite Board of Expert Advisors and through his personal involvement uh, with people like Thomas Vint and Conrad Wirth, very important early Park Service officials, both landscape architects. Uh, but it's at Yosemite that Olmsted Jr., more than anyone, was responsible for the preservation of the view we see on the lower right, uh, we've been seeing all along, uh, the famous view as you enter on Wawona Road and see the valley, uh, and this view is pretty much uh, uh, today as you would have seen it in the 1860s. The so-called Olmsted Line keeps development, this is an informal designation referring to Olmsted Jr., but it keeps development in the east end of the valley uh, so that when you come in from the west at what was once called Discovery Point, it's now called the Tunnel Overlook. <laughs> Uh, this is what you see, as you would have seen in the 1860s. Um, Elizabeth Goldstein is here. I saw her earlier. Um, and she'll be talking more with her panel about state parks in California uh, and the 1929 state park plan, uh, which is contemporary, of course, to his Bartholomew, Olmsted and Bartholomew's Los Angeles park system uh, plan. This one was implemented, though, and it was largely successful. 
It also became the most important precedent for state park planning in U.S. history. Uh, it also was important to the national park system because after 1933, the Park Service became responsible for state park planning all over the country as part of, of course, Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, and it was through state parks and the New Deal generally that Olmsted Jr., in part because of this California state park plan, in part because of his work in general, is again adapting and implementing his father's ideas from the 19th century uh, in the 20th century. Uh, tremendous influence this plan has on the Park Service's entire New Deal agenda. Um, and in a 1949 letter to the future NPS director, Conrad Wirth, this was when Conrad Wirth's father, Theodore Wirth, who was a famous landscape architect also, uh, uh, and, and the Minneapolis Park uh, director, uh, died. Olmsted Jr. wrote Conrad Wirth, comparing his father's life's work to Wirth's father's life work. And this is Olmsted the humanist. And I think this is a really important letter uh, uh, to get at the heart of what Olmsted is seeing for, uh, Olmsted Jr. is seeing uh, for the 20, for 20th century. Um, this idea that parks are above all important to human well-being. The people who use the parks are the point. You know, if we're not thinking about the people who use the parks and we're not thinking about how parks are making their lives better, then we're, you know, it's a sterile exercise. This is not to prioritize use over preservation, you know, in a contemporary sense at all. It's simply an effort to remember the true social purposes of preservation. It's not, it's not always done just for other species. Sometimes it's done for our species, and, and that is very much of an Olmstedian idea, I think, that's very much, uh, as Olmsted Jr. is expressing it, for the 20th century. It's a philosophy that imbued the entire New Deal. The work of the Park Service and the Civilian Conservation Corps, of course, in particular, uh, but imagery like this from a Park Service uh, 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 National Outdoor Recreation Plan published in 1939 indicates the sense that there is this broad purposes of this overall park making project that's undertaken through the New Deal in the 1930s. This idea of conserving both human and natural resources together as mutually dependent, uh, as inseparable. You know, the fate of the American landscape, which of course is suffering environmentally from the Dust Bowl, from deforestation, from other disasters, uh, was inextricably linked to the uh, to, the, to the fate of a generation of people who are suffering from the economic disaster of the Great Depression. So this ideal of reclaiming was both uh, in, a, in the sense of natural resources and human resources. It's New Deal ideology to the core. It's all about park making, uh, and it can be traced to the influence of Frederick Olmsted Jr., and specifically to the reiteration of his father's ideas and values. Um, and so we can identify Olmstedian park values uh, as they were re-expressed and revived by Olmsted Jr. for the unprecedented challenges of the 20th century. If I were to try to do it in a single statement, I might simply uh, put it like this. Uh, parks are not merely amenities. They're not, you know, or any of the other cliches. They are actually vital and necessary to a healthy society in terms of public health and to a functioning democracy. This is, this is the core ideology of, that Olmsted Sr. passes on to Olmsted Jr. and is a core of, of the entire New Deal project uh, as it's implemented uh, largely through the influence of officials at the National Park Services. The social purposes of public parks, I don't think, could be more profoundly construed and expressed uh, uh, than they were by uh, Olmsted Jr. Um, but if, again, Olmsted Jr. revitalized park principles for the 20th century, that leaves the question of who's doing it for the 21st century. Uh, and this is the real topic of our first panel. Not so much the past, uh, but ideas about what kind of future that past may have now, today. Um, what are the ideas and the programs? What are the initiatives that may, may be renewing some of these Olmstedian ideals for the radically new context of this century? And of course, we don't need to uh, belabor the point, but climate change, social media, the demographic restructuring of the nation, uh, the turn of this century may or may not be more dramatic than the turn of the last century, but it uh, uh, marks a lot of important changes nevertheless. Uh, and if there are important ideas and practices relating to national parks that are worth holding on to, uh, again, to do that, 
uh, these ideals must be reconceived, revived, re-expressed through programs uh, and ideas that will make these uh, I ideals work in the 21st century. So this is my way of a brief introduction for our panel, uh, who will speak about some of these new initiatives, uh, specifically in programming and education. I don't think there's any area more important in thinking about how national parks work in the 21st century than the kind of outreach uh, that occurs through programming and education. And Dr. Milton Chen is here uh, uh, to talk about some of these initiatives. By the way, the full biographies of all the speakers are online for those of you who have tablets and so on, so I won't attempt to introduce everyone adequately. Uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Chen here, one of the leaders in educational in innovation in the country uh, and a member of the National Park Service Advisory Board, so he's working specifically with national parks as well. Um, Sean Eyring is here to talk about new initiatives at the National Park Service in planning and design and, again, engagement and outreach. Um, I think that will be a theme you will hear whenever some people talk about the national park system in the 21st century. And Lucas St. Clair is here as well to talk about a new kind of national park that's being proposed uh, by, his, by him and his family's foundation uh, in northern Maine. Uh, and so the purpose of the panel then is to talk about the future, not just the past. Uh, and Dr. Chen, that's your cue. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. I'm looking over this audience, and yeah, um, I'm going to tell you about an aspect of the work with uh, park making in the national parks that you may be less familiar with, but it involves carrying forward this vision with our young people, and specifically around what they can learn in national parks. Um, you may be wondering how someone who worked for a foundation founded by filmmaker George Lucas got involved with the national parks, and... Um, fulfilling the uh, urban park vision, and the answer is that I grew up in, in San Francisco. I, I actually lived for the past 30 years in, in San Francisco, and as we like to say in the Golden Gate National Parks, uh, we live in a national park. So through that work, I got involved with the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. I think some of you are familiar with their leading work here to advocate for national parks here in the Golden Gate. And then uh, served on the Second Century Commission with my colleague, Dr. Carolyn Finney uh, from Berkeley, whom you'll hear from later this afternoon. And um, both she and I have been serving uh, along with uh, 10 others on the NPS Advisory Board. I think many of you are familiar with the fact that Director John Jarvis has really emphasized education and the learning of young people as one of his four cornerstones for the national parks. He is a tremendous leader for this effort. He understands the value of engaging the next generation of young people, a much more diverse set of young people, that uh, some of these Olmsteadian visions that you've heard about, I'm glad to hear that the work that we're doing in the 21st century is downright Olmsteadian. I can use that. I had not quite made that connection. But um, Director Jarvis understands that the, unless the next generation of Americans truly value the national parks, truly value some of these Olmsteadian virtues and values, then they will again be at risk. That is the work we're embarking on. It was very much part of the Second Century Commission report from, believe it or not, five years ago, and uh, continues to be a central part of uh, NPS's work, and uh, again, working with some of our California state parks here as well. Uh, one indication of this uh, renewed interest in education and, and youth is that Director Jarvis has appointed the first ever NPS Associate Director for Education and Interpretation and volunteers nationally at the Washington office, and that's Julia Washburn, whom I think many of you are familiar with. So Julia is carrying out this work nationally, coordinating, coordinating this work among the more than 400 NPS units. Uh, so we have great new national leadership, and uh, former Secretary Salazar was certainly a great spokesperson for this, and I think you're sensing from uh, Secretary Jewell's remarks that she also is very much engaged with youth engagement, uh, witnessed some of her most recent uh, announcements and um, partnerships with corporations to bring uh, uh, young people into the parks. So I'm titling Learning in the 21st Century and uh, the Future of the National Parks. Uh, just a few quick slides, and then I'd like to show you a, a, um, 
a segment from a video we've produced illustrating what some of this uh, actually looks like in the national parks. <laughs> we are facing both challenges around conservation and preservation, but also, as I think many of you have noticed, in education. We have a tremendous um, problem with scientific and civic illiteracy in our nation amongst not only our adults, but certainly our children. We do a terrible job of teaching history and civics in our public schools. I, for one, wish that this audience here were doubled and that there were about 200 Stanford undergraduates as part of this gathering today because they need to hear what this, this conference is all about. Maybe in the future we can make sure that this happens to involve more young people, especially at, at locations where these conferences are. One of my favorite examples of young people learning in the national parks is an article from the Stanford Magazine about three or four years ago. Um, this is kind of an atypical audience for me because usually in audiences I speak to, everyone has a tablet, everyone has an iPad, everyone's soaking up the Wi-Fi. I hope some of you are doing that because you could find this article right now. And it's a story of sophomore college here at Stanford where uh, another great uh, American historian, David Kennedy here, uh, together with Nicole Arduin, a professor of education, took about 15 Stanford undergraduates into the Grand Canyon in the fall before uh, the fall quarter starts. It is a transformative experience for our nation's best and brightest students. I can poke a little bit of fun at Stanford today. I went here as a graduate student. My daughter went here to college. Stanford, of course, views itself as the home of innovation. Uh, you know, the the birthplace of Silicon Valley, the best and brightest students. Believe me, this, these Stanford sophomores were scared to go into nature. They had never been camping before, some of them. They were afraid of bugs and what it would be like to be in the Grand Canyon. So to, the, to Stanford's credit, to, uh, to David Kennedy's credit, they took these undergraduates into the Grand Canyon for two weeks. Transformative experience, these kids came out not only knowing more about themselves, uh, being more uh, confident about themselves in nature, um, but also having a real practical idea of what water rights uh, are, are here in California. Some of them had a vague idea of becoming a lawyer, maybe an environmental lawyer, but they came out of those two weeks really understanding uh, the issue of water, uh, the Colorado River, arguably America's most important river. We can talk about that with the Easterners here, but certainly here in the West, Colorado River is very important. So um, getting kids into these national parks can be a very important experience for them. We have this issue with scientific literacy, civic literacy. I won't say much about the teaching of civics and history in our schools, but uh, for the most part, it's done quite poorly. I do believe that the national parks represent then some of the very best places to learn about climate change, to learn about the environment, to learn about civics and history. We're in a new age of learning, and uh, you see some of those factors here. We're talking about um, kids learning anytime, anywhere, uh, digital learning anytime, anywhere, using devices to access information instantly, uh, connecting with their peers and with experts online, but importantly, getting back not just here on campus and staring at their iPads and their screens and their iPhones, but getting into authentic places. Again, I, I wish that there was a semester where these Stanford undergraduates would visit places not only like the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, John Muir's home, uh, the wealth of national park sites and California uh, state parks that we have here. Hopefully I can convince some Stanford faculty to, uh, to do that. Out of school time accounts for a much higher percentage than in school time. So this is where we're trying to reinvent the American educational system, taking advantage of out-of-school time, afternoons, evenings, weekends, and summers to provide these sorts of transformative, authentic experiences. And then in fact, kids who are able to take advantage of out-of-school time, that these out-of-school experiences become important predictors of their academic achievement. I was looking at one study that showed that um, Kids of middle class and, and wealthier families uh, benefit from about $8,000 per year spent by their families to do these out-of-school experiences, to take them to museums, to science centers, to do that iconic trip into the national parks during the summer. Um, so some of the programs I'm going to talk about today are trying to make up that gap, trying to provide these opportunities to young people, and again, a much more diverse group of young people, 
uh, whose families cannot, cannot afford $8,000 a year. We're looking at a new ecosystem of learning, very different from what it was in looking into this audience when we were in school. The chance to take online courses, I hope, again, I can convince some of you who are faculty to start teaching some online courses related to the national parks. The fact that information is always on 24-7, we can take advantage of this. And uh, the role of not just schools, but also the home learning environment, museums, libraries, and parks in this new ecosystem of learning. So as I've been saying, I think national parks can play a critical role for our young people. Uh, this comes as a, um, how shall I put it, uh, a, a new thought to many policy folks and perhaps to many people in this audience today. But we know, uh, based on what we've been learning from middle school students on up who spend a week in the national parks, Nature Bridge is one of the great partners for this, a residential program, an immersive program where kids spend a week living in a national park, whether it's uh, in Marin County or it's Yosemite. So what I'd like to do is show you a short video. Um, I work for George Lucas and we believe in the power of images to communicate. Mr. Lucas once told me, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I said, boy, you know, I wish I'd thought of that. That's, that's why you're George Lucas and it's, it's true. So I'm gonna show you maybe four minutes of uh, a video we put together about kids learning in the national parks. I wanna know what it feels like to make a difference. You can have hands-on with Mother Nature. You can hand, have hands-on with geology. You can have hands-on with hydrology. And then at the same time, you can have hands-on with history. So what better place to learn all of those subjects is in the places where they occur. National parks and their many partners offer a powerful and authentic opportunity for learning. Classroom instruction is essential, but place-based learning in parks strengthens and expands on that experience, giving students and teachers a real-world connection that helps classroom content come to life. So it's neat to see them when they get there, wow, this is what we've been doing and this is what we've been reading about because they don't always get that when you give them an assignment to research and they look it up and, okay, yeah, move on. But this hopefully will stay with them for life. Yeah, that's the list. You think that might be this? The education of the geology and then the meteorology and knowing the different environments. And then the other thing that I want students to take away is growth in themselves and that they can do things and that they're independent. I want to know why I should care. I want to be part of the history I've read about. We take the students out of the classroom and bring them to the actual ecosystems. The mangrove shoreline, Biscayne Bay and its seagrasses, the islands with its hardwood hammock and its fringing mangroves, the rocky shoreline, and even out to the coral reef. So we take the curriculum that's in the classroom and we apply it to the natural resources. This is all new to them, being in a boat, seeing blue crabs with eggs on it, um, sea horses, horseshoe crabs, it just opens their eyes to another world. Through online experiences such as virtual field trips and web-based lessons, parks use technology to extend learning to all students and teachers. Technology and digital tools such as GPS and mobile data collection devices allow students to emulate the work of scientists and engage in authentic research. And it's not just the children who benefit. Workshops and institutes for teachers' professional development have long been a part of the park programs that improve teaching and learning. For many children, the chance to escape from the pressure and responsibility of everyday roles can reveal hidden strengths and talents. There are students that need to be challenged in different ways. Out here, we have students that never talk in the classroom, and all of a sudden, they're taking the lead. 
So we are providing students with a different outlet, a different um, method by which to learn and experience learning. And this is opening up their world, their appreciation of learning, and who knows where this would lead them in the future. <laughs> Make up my own questions and find the answers out myself. I want to see things I don't believe. National parks are places where our youth learn to become contributing citizens and leaders. They are places where all of America's children can discover the past and learn to cherish the heritage that will determine their future. Through a broad range of educational services, including in-depth residential programs, junior ranger programs, and online experiences, the national parks have the potential to play an even greater role in ensuring that our youth gain the knowledge, skills, and values that will shape and transform their lives for the better. <laughs> Well, in the interest of time, I'll uh, move along, but I think you get a sense of the range of educational programs for young people. Uh, I like to say this should start as early as possible, certainly in the middle school years. And uh, as we move towards the centennial of the National Parks in 2016, you'll see a lot more uh, public awareness as we begin to roll out a communications campaign about the second century and also about uh, the role of young people learning in the National Parks. I will close just by saying that, um, you know, there's a saying, in, uh, and I don't know the, the provenance of it. Many of you are architects or landscape architects uh, may know it, but uh, it may have been Winston Churchill who said, first people build buildings, and then buildings build people. Uh, I like to say that first people build parks, and then parks can help build people. And that's what this is all about. Um, this is about helping to build independent learners, citizens uh, in this country who understand the history, uh, the importance of conservation, uh, the importance of cities as places where, of course, many more millions are moving, but the importance of nature and experience in nature for all of our citizens, some of the ideas that were, that were talked about this morning. Uh, I do believe that uh, the future of our democracy has a lot to do with these experiences, raising a next generation of young people understand what it means to be a democracy, why we set, apart, uh, set aside these most important, most precious, most significant places in our nation for all to enjoy. So there's a lot to be learned through the national parks and um, we're making some progress on this. We're also embarking on some additional fundraising since uh, money has always been uh, an issue in, in park making uh, as we roll out towards uh, the 2016 centennial. You'll see um, more publicity about the importance of citizens contributing back and supporting this effort, especially around engagement of young people in our national parks. So thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Sean Eyring, and although my title in the brochure says I am Chief of Resource Planning and Compliance in um, the National Park Service's Northeast region, I'm a landscape architect. And I have spent my career, or most of my career, um, working in the cultural landscape program in the National Park Service. And so I have a real passion for the intersection of design and historic preservation. Um, Ethan asked me to um, talk about an initiative that's launched about five years ago and is continuing on today called Designing the Parks. And it's a uh, it's an initiative to really rethink the role of design in a 21st century national park. It's very much inspired by the early Olmsted and early um, designers of the national park system, their philosophies of what design could be and park making. As Ethan kind of alluded to, that um, to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., there really wasn't any inherent contradiction in preserving a place through its thoughtful development um, and it was really in every way compatible with the new National Park System's mission to preserve natural and cultural resources and make them available for future generations. The Park Service had a vital and recognized design team that grew quite large through the 30s and 40s. 
Landscape architects and engineers were key as the National Park Service modernized and developed from between World War I and II, designing roads, campgrounds, administrative villages, residential complexes, whole master plans, among other things. Well-planned and designed landscapes Well-planned and designed landscapes guided many park visitors through a considered sequence of experiences, often without the visitor realizing that there was this choreography at play. As Ethan very eloquently um, frames it in his wonderful book, Wilderness by Design, the emotional enjoyment achieved through the appreciation of landscape beauty was not an inevitable or haphazard affair. We've heard this several times, even just this morning. Now, fast forward to the 21st century. The National Park Service isn't without a design presence. Yellowstone, for example, has a full design team, architects, engineers, landscape architects. The Denver Service Center has a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience. High profile competitions and some recent design projects like Yosemite Falls under the capable hands of the Halprin office have brought really high quality design into the public eye and yielded pretty positive results for the National Park Service. But what's different is that early vision of design and preservation is working hand in hand to make a park and make it accessible to the public while still preserving all these incredibly precious and fragile resources in the National Park Service somehow kind of lost its way. It was a little bit dampened, and if it hadn't lost, it way, lost its way, it was certainly scattered. There certainly may be a lot of reasons for it. Um, the rise of the environmental movement. Um, National Park Service shifted their priorities during that time period from about mid-century onward, mid-20th century onward an increasing tendency towards program compartmentalization or stovepiping, as we might call it. And even as the, second, as the second half of the 20th century moved along, there was kind of a move away from the master site plan into more general management planning, which in my, often general management plans are completely devoid of any kind of physical site design. At any rate, there was really a growing skeptical view of, of the role of design in public in national parks. And I, I use this image of the Cyclorama Center at Gettysburg not to pass judgment on it, on, but I, I know most, a lot of you probably know this controversy. And I think for me it really illustrated just how polar the discussion had become of the role, the value of design, and certainly in a historical park like Gettysburg the two really couldn't be compatible to many, many people. And ultimately, you probably know that the Cyclorama Center was taken down and the landscape is in the process of being restored based on research of what it looked like in the 19th century during the, the Civil War period. So designing the parks was really born out of this tension. Ethan's work was coming into the forefront and provided a lot of clarity. Um, that gave kind of a spring to this initiative. And several National Park Service leaders in both design and preservation, Stephanie Toothman, who was then the um, Chief of Cultural Resources in the Pacific West region, Roger Evans at the Denver Service Center, Rolf Diamant, who's a board member of the um, NAOP, and John Jarvis, who was then the um, Regional Director of the Pacific West region, all saw the value in trying to reconnect to the National Park Service with it, this former design heritage and also begin to think about the role of design in helping to solve some of the most complex problems that the Park Service was beginning to face in the 21st century. Designing the Parks was launched as a two-part bi-coastal conference. I see that there's um, kind of a trend towards two-part conferences. Bicoastal certainly was kind of thinking about the eastern and western um, offices of design and construction in the National Park Service, which was part of the way it was um, structured historically. Part one was to look at 
the history of park planning and design, and that was held in Charlottesville, Virginia in May of 2008. And part two focused on the present and future of park planning and design, and that was held in Cavallo Point in San Francisco in December of 2008. And this whole vision for this initiative is to rethink the role of design in the National Park Service, or rethink the role of design and planning as a vital component of preservation, park making, and the visitor experience. Conference goals were to assess lessons learned through an examination of park planning and design history, and also to formulate design principles that would guide park managers as they embraced new 21st century challenges. We assembled a key group of partners because part of this was reaching out. It wasn't just the National Park Service talking to itself. Par the National Park Service, University of Virginia, of course, Ethan was there at the time, was really an important um, partner in this effort. Van Allen Institute out of New York City, the Cultural Landscape Foundation, the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, the National Parks Conservation Association all came together and played a really important role in helping get this off the ground and help continue to push it forward. Part one, hosted by University of Virginia, explored the history of park planning and design, as I mentioned before. But the, but the symposium was graphically recorded and moderated, and we took the results of this conference to forward to inform Designing the Parks Part Two, which was held at Cavallo Point, and just an amazing environment to begin to think about um, what it means to come up with design principles for a 21st century national park. We had about 250 public, private, academic, students all come together to begin to think about what design principles would look like. Really rich interactive sessions each day narrowing down the ideas further and further until finally we distilled it down to six general principles that park planning and design for the 21st century must demonstrate reverence for place, engagement of all people, expansion beyond traditional boundaries, sustainability, informed decision making, and integrated research planning, design, and review. We also came up with at least a starting point for the like an initial mission, if you will, for how the Designing the Parks initiative would move forward following this conference. And what we came up with was that it provides a forum for collegial interdisciplinary discussion through workshops, competitions, and pilot projects that aims to build a common foundation of design principles for guiding 21st century park planning and design. So the next steps then were to publish a book from the proceedings for Designing the Park Part One. Create a web log of outstanding design and planning examples and awarding superior examples. Examples that illustrated those design principles that we came up with in this conference at Cavallo Point. Also developing partnerships to begin to promote design innovation in the MPS through student competitions a way of bringing youth, youthful thinking into the process. I'd also just like to mention here that designing the parks really came at a good time. I mentioned that John Jarvis, as the regional director of the Pacific West region, was very involved in the designing the parks conferences. Well, of course now, you just heard, he's, he's National Park Service director. And he has been very supportive of this project. And we have found that the whole mission and the whole um, the whole, all the pilot projects that we're working on for designing the parks really fit within many of Director Jarvis's call to action items, which are all about youth, about diversity, about workforce, about modernizing the national park, you know, really addressing some of the 21st century challenges that the Park Service is facing and moving, moving towards our centennial. But back to outcomes. Between 20, between 2008, from the end of the conference to today, we finally last year published Public Nature. Some of you may have seen it. It's um, University of Virginia Press. 
excellent, um, it's gotten excellent reviews and it's based on the um, essays from Designing the Parks Part One. The Denver Service Center launched a pilot awards program. We got 75 submissions and awarded 17 um, awards to both US and international public parks that really best illustrate the design principles, including Brooklyn Bridge Park in New, York's, in New York City, Santa Fe, Fe Rail Yard in Santa Fe, the waterfront Bunkaza Cultural Plaza in Osaka, Japan, and these are all really illustrate how to, how to reach out to people in the 21st century and preserve place and make really vital, vibrant public spaces. We've developed a really rich partnership with the Van Allen Institute in, based in New York, who is a 100-year-old nonprofit foundation whose mission is design education and innovation. And they have helped us launch two student competitions to reimagine America's national parks for the 21st century. The first competition was held two years ago and was national. And nine um, design student, um, schools of design and planning were selected to focus on a problem that seven national parks, they were each assigned to one national park that a design problem, some kind of an issue that, a park was, that that park was facing that they would come up with really innovative ideas for how to, how to, how to solve that problem. The second um, Van Allen Institute um, competition that we're just embarking on is designing the park's experience, and that actually will address some of the things that Milton was talking about in his talk. Except it's looking at small national parks who are really struggling to, with budget, with staff. And with this competition, we're asking young professionals, young and emerging professionals working with students to give small parks ideas on how they can how, how they can maintain a really vibrant visitor experience using a number of tools, but especially focused on how there's no money and there's no staff for a lot of these small parks and they're really struggling to figure out how to keep that visitor experience and visitor education really strong. We've also launched, a, we've kind of thought a lot about um, diversity in national parks and design and one of the things that we all realize through some of our discussions is, is that unless we as a profession are diverse, it's much harder to design spaces that really are meaningful to the widest range of people. So we, are, we have also launched a Designing the Parks mentoring internship where we're partnering or pairing a graduate student of design, an undergraduate student of design, and two high school students reaching all the way down to the high school level working together on projects in national parks. We've done this for two years in a row, one at Independence National Historical Park, and last year at Pedix Island, and they've both been really successful, and the students have done a great job. It's been a good way of reaching out to a wide variety of young people. And then finally, probably in the most, to me, one of the most challenging issues that is facing us in the National Park Service, certainly in the upcoming years, and where I think design can really have, play a very significant role is with climate change. Next week in New York City, we are bringing together a number of professionals and public policymakers to talk, to work on a session called Preserving Coastal Heritage where we're looking at climate change and how to address its impacts specifically on cultural resources. And this session will look at a planning process for the kinds of things we really need to think about specifically for historic resources in national parks. And we'll follow that with a part two a number of months later where we'll take that planning process and zoom in and look at what design looks like. What are some real design solutions that can address, increase landscape resiliency, really help some of our resources survive um, preserve our resources in the face of some of these really challenging times. Um, as you can see, the 
case studies and issues that we'll be dealing with are from New York City, have been hammered really hard by Hurricane Sandy, and there's certainly only thoughts that more of this is to come. So as Olmsted introduced in an early National Park Service, a way of thinking about design and its role in carrying out the National Park Service mission, we're really attempting to do that again with designing the parks and really through these pilot projects, raise the interest, raise the importance of considering thoughtful site planning and design as a really vital component of preserve, preservation, conservation, and access in our 20th century, 21st century national parks. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lucas St. Clair, and I'm the president of our family's private operating foundation, which is called Elliottsville Plantation, based in Portland, Maine. And uh, what I'm going to speak to you about this morning is um, you know, prior to the opportunity of designing parks, they have to be created. And in the 21st century, that can be quite a challenge, uh, one that I'm in the midst of uh, at the moment. And defining the purpose of the parks is something that I spend almost all of my time doing, uh, making sure that people understand that beyond these iconic landscapes, they are uh, vital for education, for um, resilience to global, global warming, environmental issues that we're facing, and interpreting the cultural heritage of a region, sometimes that, that really has gone unnoticed or unknown. We in Maine are fortunate to have an incredible forest. Maine is the most um, forested state in the United States, and the northern part of Maine is 12 million acres on, of uninterrupted northern hardwood and boreal forest. It's a pretty amazing place. Um, and it's been owned up until the 1970s by private landowners. Not a bit of it is public. Um, the land uh, was kept intact by these landowners that also owned the paper and pulp mills that existed there. And the trees were, were harvested and brought to the mills where we, we made uh, newsprint and phone books and, um, and pulp. Well, the industry of pulp and paper manufacturing has, has changed drastically. And um, I have a three-year-old daughter who I'm quite confident will not know what a phone book is. So the days of, of, of making, a, making that, uh, and especially making it in northern Maine, are gone. At one point, the East Millinocket Mill, which is sort of at the heart of all of this, is, um, was the largest paper mill in the world, and today it's closed. So as these paper companies closed, they began to sell off all of the land, and the 12 million acres that existed in northern Maine went on the market. And over the course of 20 years, um, the land changed hands, and from about 10 landowners to now well over 150. In that process, uh, REITs and TMOs, private equity companies, purchased some of it, and conservation interests purchased some of it as well, including our foundation. We now own about 150,000 acres in, in sort of central Maine, next to Baxter State Park in the northern terminus of the Appalachian Trail, which is also a, a national park unit. Um, Despite this great conservation effort that has gone on over the last 20 years and protecting some amazing landscape, the region has declined uh, in, in population and in personal income, and there's been an uh, exodus from, from the region. And so we started thinking about uh, internally as our family and our foundation is this conservation that we're trying to do, who is it for? We started thinking, conservation for whom? How can these regions, these communities that live around this great northern forest and this incredible natural resource benefit from it while still doing conservation? And so we began to think about the national parks and how national parks, uh, beyond the conservation implications and the wonderful history and education that they provide, they also provide tremendous economic benefits. Um, benefits um, to the point of for every dollar invested in the national parks, ten dollars is returned to the local communities, which is a pretty significant investment to, to think about. So we set about trying to create a park, and um, in uh, the early 2000s, uh, my mother, who was running the foundation at the time, pitched the idea. And in a place that has, in a state that has less than 5% public land and has a 
150-year-old tradition of harvesting timber and making paper, the idea of the federal government coming in and owning land was not a, uh, not a happy uh, thought for many, many people. And it was essentially running into a buzzsaw. It was um, an idea that was hit with tremendous resistance, and uh, we sort of had to step back and think, okay, how, how are we going to really, really do this? So we knew we had a beautiful resource, um, but we knew that the way that we were going about convincing people of it was, um, was wrong. And in the fall of 2011, after many attempts of public outreach and grassroots effort to describe the park and the benefits for the region, uh, we had the opportunity to sit down with former Secretary Salazar and with uh, Director Jarvis. And they sat down with us and described what it was like to create a park in the 21st century. And Secretary Salazar had a great analogy. He said, this, think of it as if this national park that you'd like is running for US Senate. And think about what goes on in a Senate campaign and all of the different aspects of that campaign and the intense work and investment that has to go into it. And that is not at all the way we were approaching it. And something that seemed like a really fresh and unique and potentially successful road path forward. It was at that moment that my mom retired and said, <laughs> I have no interest at this, running a campaign like this at all. Um, and turned over the full-time responsibility of the foundation to me. And um, in the last three years, that's exactly what we've, we've set out to do, using very traditional tool, campaign tools. We hired campaign consultants. We hired pollsters and economic um, commissioned economic studies. Um, we have lobbyists that are working for us in DC. We've partnered with conservation NGOs in Maine and working on a grassroots and grass tops campaign that's been waging uh, now for, um, for three years. Um, this is a picture of the landscape, and, and much of northern Maine looks like this. Um, it's, it's a rare uh, opportunity, especially east of the Mississippi, to see a landscape without development. Um, despite being a very remote and, and wild-feeling place, it is uh, a, within a day's drive to 25% of the population of the United States. So we realized that a lot of people could come here. And uh, Acadia National Park, which is our neighbor uh, on the coast of Maine, gets about two and a half million visitors every year. And most of those visitors come between May and October. So um, directing people through that resource is a very, very important piece of, um, of the work that we're doing. This is a picture of uh, Mount Katahdin and the east branch of the Penobscot. Mount Katahdin is the northern terminus of the Appalachian Trail and is protected within a state park. Uh, one of our governors, Percival Baxter, uh, purchased land from the state of Maine and from some of these timber companies because there was very little timber up there uh, above tree land. They, they sold the land. Um, and he protected 210,000 acres as, as one of the crown jewels of Maine in a state park. Um, the east branch of the Penobscot is the headwaters to the Penobscot River system the watershed that drains three quarters of the state of Maine, a very significant um, river system that flows into Penobscot Bay. There is another shot of Mount Katahdin, as you can see, most of it treeless at the, at the top. It's, it's uh, 10 feet shy of a mile high and the highest point in Maine. And the, the, the wilderness aspect of this park is really unique um, because it is located so close to so many people but yet the habitat is also um, a, a big piece of this. And that brings us to the cultural heritage of the region and the way people have been using this land for, uh, for 150 years. Um, the sportsman tradition is, is, very, um, is a very real part of the landscape of Northern Maine and hunting and um, hunting especially is, is a big piece of this. And the National Park Service um, under the Organic Act does not allow hunting. And so we've started to think about how can we incorporate the traditional uses of a region and really a big piece of the cultural heritage of the region into a unique, uh, a, a unique park. And what would that look like? And so we started digging through um, authorizing language for parks uh, around the country and spent a lot of time looking at ANILCA, uh, the, the Alaska Lands Act, and how they incorporated a, 
Maine is very much like Alaska. Uh, it's Alaska of the East. Things are a bit smaller, um, but we have this sort of fierce independence and um, feel like there is the, there's Maine and then there's the rest of the country. And um, so because of that, a lot of the language that's used in the Alaska Lands Act is, is relevant to, to the people of Maine. And we've settled um, after about two and a half years of, of outreach into the community on, on creating a two-park two unit, um, very much like they'd done in Alaska, creating a, a park with an adjacent preserve. Um, the language preserve doesn't resonate in Maine. It sounds like you're trying to preserve it. And um, so we've chosen to use a national recreation area and creating a multi-park unit, um, a national park with an adjacent recreation area. And in the recreation area, incorporating authorizing language that would allow for hunting and for some snowmobiling and some of the, the uses that have been going on there for uh, the last, not snowmobiling, but certainly hunting for the last 100 years. And then using those uses to in, 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 interpret some of the history. Uh, this is where Teddy Roosevelt, when he was a young man, as a kind of scrawny asthmatic, left New York City and became a man. In, on his, um, as he was getting close to death in 1919, he wrote an essay uh, to celebrate Maine's centennial called My Debt to Maine. And it was about him coming here to this exact region, climbing Katahdin for the first time, shooting bear and moose in the woods, and realizing what it meant to be an outdoorsman, and the influence that Maine and the landscape had on him. And then, of course, he went on to do uh, incredible conservation, um, you know, millions and millions of acres into conservation, and using the Organic Act 18 times to create, and then on uh, nine national parks came of those, those monuments that he created. Um, so using the sportsman uh, heritage and, and, the, and the people that, that were sportsmen early on and how it influenced Maine as, as part of the storytelling that could go on within, within this park. So not only is it just a place to come and hunt, but it's a place to come and hunt and learn about the early sportsmen and how they contributed to conservation in the United States. Um, there are also some pretty unique um, critters up there, the Canadian lynx, which is a um, uh, a very a rare species that lives uh, a lot of, there, there's, there's many of them on, on the property that we're talking about. Um, and so now we are in, uh, we're, we're getting close to, to authorizing, to drafting authorizing language. We've created what we call a framework um, where we went out to all of these interest groups and stakeholders in the region to establish bottom lines, saying if, if there was a park and recreation area here, what would it have to look like in order for you to embrace it? And establishing all of these bottom lines in a framework and getting people to sign off on it, and then taking those, all of those frameworks that we've sent out into the community and gathering them back up uh, to, to draft authorizing language. And then we simply take it to Washington and pass it through Congress. So um, we, we obviously have some very heavy lifting in front of us in order to do that. Um, but there is a great excitement around the centennial and the potential for a centennial bill and having some lands aspect, a lands bill aspect of that. Um, we've been working very closely with DOI and the Park Service so they, they know of our efforts. And um, we are hopefully going to have this finished um, you know, certainly in my lifetime. <laughs> and I believe uh, that's, that's it. The question I thought we could start with was to ask all of you, basically, what, what is the future of the past? You know, what about Olmsted Jr.'s life and work do you think remains relevant to the kinds of projects and programs that you're describing in education and outreach? Um, in designing the parks uh, and, in and in new park proposals. Um, so I thought we could start just by asking each of you maybe to try to reflect on uh, the legacy of Olmsted Jr. and how it may or may not be relevant to what you're doing now. Sure, I, I guess I, I can start. Um, when I 
what, what I have realized recently is the best advocate for this park plan that I'm working on is the land itself. Um, and the best tool that I have for advocacy is a 15 passenger van that I can fill up with people and take into the landscape to see. And as I bring people there and seeing them have sort of these epiphanies about what the landscape looks like, realizing how incredibly important it is to have the roads turn in the right direction and have the, the view unfold at the correct moment and realizing that there are some great minds that have gone into thinking about that over you know, 100, and, and 100 plus years. And, and how important the design element is. It's, it's been a profound thing to think about, um, and, and it's been fascinating to be here in the last day listening to, to those examples. Well, I'll follow on. Um, I think that just designing the parks, the whole basis for it was really drawing from the Olmstedian vision of you know, really thinking about how design can really be part and parcel of preserving natural and cultural resources, that it really was the way to make these places accessible. And, I, and, and for designing the parks, we're really continuing that. But one place where I really see it being absolutely really put to the test is, um, is with the climate change and the impacts that climate change is already showing to have, certainly on many of the national parks that were hit by Hurricane Sandy, just for one. But that's not the only place by any means. And, I think more than any other time, we are going to have to think about the intersection between nature and culture in a way that we just haven't had to before. And I think that's where some of the Olmsted vi vision is going to really, really serve us well. And I hope that through some of our Designing the Parks pilot projects, we'll really be able to show that and um, show how design can really help um, move parks forward as they really struggle with these challenging issues. And, and for me, it's really connecting uh, parks to people. It was wonderful to uh, hear of the letter that uh, um, Olmsted Jr. wrote to the director of the NPS uh, back then, uh, that the, both of their fathers felt strongly about this connection of, of parks to people and making that connection in a new way. Um, there are real substantial obstacles to doing this related to just practical things around transportation and time, uh, finding the time for young people to have these sort of experiences and, and getting them into those 15 passenger buses. Um, so uh, that's some of the very practical things we're working on. Uh, you can direct a question to the entire panel, to a specific panel member, sir, right here. Uh, <clears throat> a can you identify yourself? Oh, uh, Mike Vanderman. It's great to hear you. Um, a conference is a heck of a lot of words, and it's hard to wrap your mind around it. I mean, mine is, my brain is almost full already. Uh, so I think it, um, that uh, one of the beat poets, uh, the one you never hear about, black co uh, a black poet named Bob Kaufman, summed all of this up in one sentence, and uh, in one metaphor. And he said, cities should be built on one side of the street. And I think that that, uh, is a good, maybe a good way to say what we're talking about. Thank you. We have a person in the back. And as we get in the line, there's a queue here. Is there somebody over here who wants to? There's a person, in the, two people in the back, back here. One second, we're gonna go over here first. My name is Thomas Herrera Mischler. I'm the CEO of the Olmsted Park System in Buffalo and a member of the NAOP board. I was wondering if the panelists, and Sean in particular or Ethan, could discuss uh, the role of landscape architecture in this intersection between nature and um, culture. Well, I'm a little biased <laughs> as a landscape architect. But um, I think, again, as the, you know, as I get more involved, get pulled more into coming up with ideas and solutions for preserving cultural resources in the face of like climate, some impacts of climate change, it's really the landscape architects that are there at the table that are understanding these larger systems way of thinking that is really what's going to be required to be able to understand what's happening to the world, to the earth, and address it. 
And I, I'm seeing that more and more, certainly outside of the National Park Service, in the private sector of landscape architecture. And I'm really looking towards bringing that into the Park Service, more, you know, raising landscape architects as a much stronger voice and helping to bring together the, the preservation side and the conservation side in a really meaningful way through both design and good planning. Um, so that's one certain place, Ethan. If parks didn't have a social purpose, we wouldn't need landscape architects, right? I mean, we could have biologists and, 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 and wildlife managers managing parks. And if landscape architects aren't addressing social purposes when they're working on parks, then we still don't need landscape architects because <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> okay, over here, are we, oh, sorry, over here, yeah. Uh, yes, maybe Ethan, I could focus on that uh, uh, statement, but I'm Jerry Wright uh, graduated the University of Maine School of Forestry in um, 1956, so I started 62 years ago. Uh, so I've had a long path to out here at the West, but one of the issues that concerns me is this education question for people beyond this room. And I give a statement about Central Park that Walt Whitman made a comment that Olmsted should not have placed all those rocks around it. He should have let the park just flow out into the city. And what concerns me sometimes if I tried to thought about going to national parks, how, what a small percentage get to the national parks. And then some of those that come back say, well, the answer is in the national parks or it's in the park in my city, which is a mile away. And nature begins out of everybody's doorstep, the first step out. So I do think if we're thinking about the 21st century, we should have a different approach, and that nature is around us throughout the entire city. All it takes is a single tree. And I was very impressed with people from Seattle describing uh, the tree walks that they take. And to me, this is something I look forward to hearing more about out in the West. Comments from the panel? Uh, just a quick comment that um, couldn't agree more, that uh, the issue is that our young people are growing up just staring at their screens, and they don't even look at the trees uh, outside their door. Um, it's astonishing that kids, uh, I live in San Francisco, who just live a bike ride uh, a bus ride from the ocean. There are high school students in San Francisco who have never seen the ocean. Somehow in 17 or 18 years, no one, including themselves, their parents, their teachers, have ever seen fit to go there. Um, this is not unusual, by the way. There are many, many young people in your communities who have not visited some of the places that you know and love. So in the work with the National Parks, we not only want them to visit the national parks that they can, if they are nearby, but also uh, to bring that knowledge home, to start with the connection to your own uh, city parks, your own state parks. So the partnerships that are being created around that are very important. Uh, my name is Margot Higgins, and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. I work with Carolyn. And I work on um, Wrangell St. Elias Park, very broadly speaking, looking at how Anilka has played out there. Um, and I have concerns in that particular place about the very um, static focus on the mining era as um, an example of the human history in that place that is the dynamic nature human interaction. And so this question is mostly for Lucas. I'm curious about um, the, ex the language that you have drawn on from Anilka, how that's been useful specifically, and also um, any concerns that you have about limiting the history to that 100-year um, history and um, the current living history of sport hunters in that area. Um, I think there's a lot of promise in that, and I also think there are some limitations. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, the main piece of the legislation that we're looking at is giving preferential treatment to guides, outfitters, and concessionaires. Um, the landscape of northern Maine is really, um, it, it's very, um, it, 
people that work in it are very passionate about it and feel like uh, they should have the right to be able to continue to guide and, and um, have outfitters uh, working on, on the land and, and give preferential treatment to Mainers. Um, and the idea of having hunting and uh, in, in places is important, but um, it, it certainly is a concern about you know, how, how it plays out over the course of you know, what is it like in, 2000, or in 2100 when we're all long gone. And um, how is the habitat protected? And uh, the, the language is, is not yet drafted, and we're still looking very carefully at, at um, of, of the 401 park units, 80 of them allow hunting. And so we're looking at all of them and saying which ones are successful and which ones aren't and for what reasons. Um, and, and motorized use is a huge concern of mine. Allowing, allowing snowmobiling it is very important for the local community. It, it, it brings in $400 million into the local economy in Penobscot County, and so not allowing it would, would be a deal breaker. But I recognize that um, the snowmobiles are contributing to um, a, a lot of harm, in, and so managing that in a way so it doesn't become, doesn't get overrun is a, is, a, is a big concern. So it's still very much in the planning stages, but um, something that we're, we're thinking about really, really carefully. And also I, another unit that I think is really interesting is Marsh Billings in Vermont and how um, they, they use timber harvesting as, as a way to talk about a renewable resource and when, uh, when harvested correctly and sustainably, it can be an amazing thing. Um, and using it more as an exhibition rather than a industrial forest. And th that striking that balance, uh, they do well in, in Marsh Billings and ho hoping to create and strike that same balance in Northern Maine. I think right down here, one of these, there, there are a couple of you right there. Hello, my name is Trisha Bastian. I live right near Prospect Park in Brooklyn. I came in last night and I really thank all of you for this opportunity. Prospect Park, I've lived there more than half my life now, and it has changed. It, there's a, the Central Park Conservancy, and there's the Prospect Park Alliance. And I've been very concerned with just the feet on the ground that I've seen in Prospect Park with the Alliance. They did things like they just put in a multi-million dollar skating center that effectively destroys the vista of the lake. Now you can see exactly how small it is. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't. It looks at this point like a truck stop gas station from certain areas, like it's a double-decker thing. And meanwhile, they're allowing some of the beautiful things to decay. There's a Victorian thing with, um, I don't even know what structure, like a gazebo, it's metal, the concert pavilion. They did restore some of it, but it's very ham-fisted. There's a lot of like... It's a beautiful thing, but for people who are walking their dogs or just going there, there's a huge, um, the park rangers do not enforce. There's barbecuing going on to the point where you joggers can't jog during the summertime because it's so thick, and rather than using it as an education, I have a collection, I'm working on a huge um, sculpture of just lot found fishing line and murals and tackle, and I've also, because of all the erosion, I found some amazing artifacts, you know, just with my eyes. And like, I, do you have um, campaign buttons? Like I am lucky enough to vacation in Maine and I think it's fantastic what you're doing. And I've also been lucky or unlucky enough to live in Texas and I'd always considered the Maine sportsmen to be a little more sportsmanlike than they are say in Texas. So that kind of distresses me. <laughs> but the one thing that I wanted to bring up and I couldn't access my iPad is there's a sportsman bill being in Congress right now that is allowing hunting in, major, in national parks, and I've heard hardly anything of it. Does anyone here know about this? It's like a tremendously huge, huge threat to all of the park systems in America, and it's just sort of slipping under the radar. The, the guns in? More than guns. It's like the more you look at it, and I've just recently become aware of it, and I can look it up later and, and let you know about it. Yeah, too. It's, it's frightening. But what about the, uh, getting off the phone, uh, the Silicon Valley, what about the, the Buses being used that are t taking people to work, then bringing kids to um, to the parks. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good idea. I, I'm a visitor, although I've lived in Los Angeles for some 30 years. Um, 
moved up to Pasco, where my grandchildren are. I'm a retired landscape architect. We're growing fast. We got 90 people a day walking up uh, Little Beaver Mountain. We've outgrown the facility. And the neighbors next north of us are developing vineyards in a really big way. And they closed out all the hikers from walking the ridge trails until they discovered that hikers were thirsty and wanted wine. And then they extended the access to those trails into the growing suburbs at the base of the mountains and discovered that people were happier buying houses along those trails. Not always the drunk property owner on the river who wants the college kids to go away. Unexpected opportunities. At 20% a year, we're going to double our size in five years. It's kind of impressive. But there are opportunities to pay for your park, as they did in Ely, Minnesota, with an extended guide and canoeing program that keeps strangers with guns from cruising your parks unobserved. So just want you to know there's hope out there. We're coming. We're going to catch up with the public parks. But it, we have to get into a few more meetings. Check, check. There you go. Um, I have a question uh, for the panel, and that is the role of philanthropy. We have two nonprofit representatives here, and academic and uh, professional park. But the early on in the park system, I'm, you're going to be the young Rockefeller. Um, but the role of philanthropy has always been a key element in all parks. And from, I think, the Lucaside Foundation, you're doing something really important. But the lift that you have kind of by yourself will, will in no way be able to be done by one organization. Where are the zillionaires coming from here getting involved in getting kids out to parks in, in, in the national park movement? Um, right now there's a bill in, uh, in Congress to prevent any new national park additions, including uh, um, restricting the president from using the Antiquities Act to create new monuments. That's where we are. So where are, where, where is the support? Where can you get that support? We had a very hard time raising the money even for this conference. I think Milton should, should start out there, but I just want to say when we say outreach, we mean to zillionaires as well as to, <laughs> <laughs> as well as to, to other populations. And that's sort of something this group should really be tasked with, is, is finding that kind of, it's, it's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, just, just quickly, that uh, this is very much on our radar. Uh, it's very much in our thinking uh, in, in the run up to the centennial as you begin to see more affirmation of the value of the national parks nationally. It's still a case that needs to be made to many philanthropic you know, supporters and donors. We've had great experience here at the Golden Gate with philanthropic support from you name it, just about every major foundation from the Haases and the Bechtels. Um, so, but you're right, an enormous amount of wealth has been created in the past decade or two without much thought to the importance of nature and national parks and conservation. So making that case to the new wealth, I'll say, put it that way, that has been created is very important, but again, very much on our minds. Do you want to add anything? I, I agree entirely. And you know, I certainly have studied Lawrence Rockefeller and, and the work that he's done. And, I think a lot of the it's sort of precedent setting, you know, knowing that this may take 30 years to create a park, but the communities have eventually embraced it, and 59 out of 59 times, the struggle to create scenic parks has been positive. So because of that precedent and because of the hard work that's gone in prior to me being even alive, certainly gives me the optimism to keep working at it. <laughs> 